John's Gospel, chapter 7, verse 30. So they were seeking to arrest him. They were seeking to arrest Jesus. Why were they trying to arrest him? Because they hate him. He told his brothers in verse 7, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify about it that its works are evil. His brothers fit right in with the world system. They, well, they were human, children of Adam. Their way of thinking is, was, what is natural to all human beings. Remember what James said? We looked at James 3.15. The wisdom that does not come down from above is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Human thinking is demonic thinking. Ever since Adam listened to Satan's deceit and violated God's command, human beings have lived in a system of purpose and thought that is severed from their creator. Paul reminds the Ephesian Christians that that's how it was for them before they were saved through faith in the powerful good news of Jesus Christ. He says in Ephesians 2, you were dead in the trespass and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Paul says, you Christians need to understand that that's how we all were. We were headed for the judgment of God, and we deserved it. Yes, we did. Every one of us. That's why the wrath of God is poured out on the descendants of Adam. Remember when we studied the book of Romans? Paul starts his great exposition of justification by faith with the fact that that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their ungodliness suppress the truth. Suppress the truth? That's crazy. That's demonic. But that's the way the children of Adam do. That's what these Jews we see here in chapter 7. Even these special people of God, possessors and preservers of the word of God, were trying to kill Jesus. People do not like having the evil that they do brought to their attention. They don't like that. That's why they're trying to arrest Jesus. It's a great cover-up. But God will not let that happen. Jesus' very presence is a testimony against them that they are sinners. They are under the wrath of God. The fact that he is there standing among them means that they desperately need a Savior. God will put an end to evil. It will stop. It cannot continue. You know, when people see things that just make them kind of cringe and horror, they often say things like, well, if God exists, why doesn't he do something? What do you think God has been doing all these centuries? As soon as Adam and all of us in him fell into sin and judgment, God began a rescue campaign. Paul tells the Ephesians, you tasted the first fruits of that rescue, continuing on in Ephesians 2. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace he had been saved. And raised us up with him. And seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The rescue is through Jesus Christ. It's in him. 
It's not through people reforming themselves. It's through new life by being joined to the one who died on the cross for our sins. We receive that new life through faith. Jesus told the Jews in chapter 6, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Now to bring people this new life, he must go to the cross. That's the central event of the rescue campaign. The guilt of sin must be paid for. But that act of payment must take place at the time God has set for it. So, verse 30 again. They were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. It will come. Right on schedule. God's schedule. So there's the opposition. It's, it's so human. That's what people do. They suppress the truth. And it, it seems impossible to overcome that. But it's not. Not when God is at work. Verse 31. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? Now, there's that word that's so special to John as he writes his gospel, signs. Remember his purpose statement at the end of the book, chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The Holy Spirit moved him to pick out seven of these signs and write them down for us. That was a good number. We look at him turning water into wine in chapter 2. A family facing shame from a culture of that day because they failed at the all-important wedding feast was rescued from shame by the creator of words. We looked at him healing a royal official son in chapter 4. And you know, it didn't even matter that Jesus wasn't even there. He needed grace for all, even for members of a corrupt government. We saw him healing a, up a, a, healing a shriveled up man by the pool of Bethesda in chapter 5. Shriveled up for 38 years. Disease has no power that Jesus cannot handle. In chapter 6, we saw him feed a hungry multitude with five flat bread cakes and two sardines. There is no insufficiency that Jesus cannot supply abundantly. In chapter 6, we also saw him walk on the Sea of Galilee and calm a storm. You know, David said in Psalm 8, we see man with everything placed in subjection under him. To which the writer to the Hebrews scratches his head and says, we don't see that yet. When man fell into sin, he lost his rule over creation. He does not rule over storms, they rule over him. Every time a hurricane comes up, and it's the wind is starting to blow and the news media is out. They always, every news media outlet sends out someone with a parka and a microphone to stand in the hurricane force winds. Did you see the video of the reporter that actually got hit by a tree branch sometime last year? It, it was dramatic. The, the anger said, are, are you all right? Are you all right? I'm all right. They will stop doing that when the reporter dies, but they will not stop before that because they're competing for your audience. That's an example of thinking that is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Man does not rule over storms, they rule over him. The writer of the Hebrews is right. We don't see everything placed in subjection under man. But, Hebrews 2 9. He tells us what we do see. We see him. 
who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by, great, by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. That sign, that miracle demonstrating his power as the word who was with God and was God through whom all things were made, that sign, along with the others, all the others that Jesus did, all those signs, that's all the proof anybody needed to believe and be saved. And the sign certainly got people's attention. Verse 31. The leaders were seeking to arrest him, yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? Now they were looking for the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed deliverer promised in the Old Testament. And they expected that there were going to be signs. Things were going to happen that pointed clearly to the fact that he's finally here. And the pilgrims here in chapter 7 that have come into Jerusalem for the Feast of Booths, they've got it right. When the Christ appears, this is exactly what we expect to see. So isn't it logical that yeah, it's just possible that this could be the one? This sounds encouraging. Now, it was faith based on miracles. And that saves no one. In chapter 2, the beginning of his ministry, we saw that many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But, John says, Jesus on his part did not believe in them because he knew all people. He knew what was in their hearts. They were not looking to him as a savior for sin. In chapter 6, when the crowd followed him because they ate the miraculous bread, they're only looking for more bread. Getting excited about miracles saves no one. But at least for these people here, it was a beginning. Remember Nicodemus we looked at in chapter 3? He was attracted by the miracles. He said to Jesus, no one can do these signs that you do unless God was with him. It was only a start. It was a start. Jesus had to face him with the fact that he must be born again and that he must look to a savior who was lifted up like a serpent on a pole and he will end up taking a stand for the crucified savior. We'll see that at the, at the end of the gospel. He will risk his life to do that. By the way, is it worth it risking your life to serve Jesus Christ?
things get done. You know, you know how it usually works. People with this mindset elect certain people with their mindset, and people with that mindset elect people with that mindset, and so they argue in the legislature or in Congress, and, and nothing gets done, and the people who elected them, how come they don't do anything? And, well, here, here are governmental officials who, they're united, they're gonna get something done. Things can get done when the government unites, unless, of course, God overrules them. And by the way, he always does. In their united governmental authority, they sent members of the temple guard to arrest Jesus. Sounds kind of final, doesn't it? But what ends up happening is that Jesus arrested them. We will see that at the end of the chapter, but we just touched on that today. There is someone who is in danger. And it's not Jesus. Matthew and Luke record Jesus explaining to his disciples how it really is. Matthew 10, 28. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That is spiritual thinking. If all you fear is the killing of the body, that is demonic thinking. That's how the world thinks. When you boil it down, all they're afraid of is death. That's how the devil keeps them in slavery. They are, as the writer to the Hebrew says, those who fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. They're afraid of physical death. And Physical death is a scary thing. Isn't it, Lloyd? <laughs> I'm glad you're still here. Man, yeah. hey, I'd be a lot of work for you to do if you were. <laughs> it's a scary thing. The, the Bible calls death an enemy. It's the last enemy that will be destroyed by the Lord Jesus. But part of Satan's program of deception is that they're so scared of death they don't allow themselves to think about what comes after it. Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So, as Jesus told his disciples, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Well, let me ask you a question. Should we be afraid of God? You better be afraid of God. John was. Let me prove it to you. You know, in the three and a half years of Jesus' public ministry, John got really close to Jesus. John refers himself to himself as the disciple Jesus loved. There was a closeness between them that was special. When we get to chapter 13 at the Last Supper, it did not look like Leonardo da Vinci's famous painting where they're all sitting in European chairs and you, you, you see John leaning over like that very uncomfortably with his head on Jesus' breast. Uh, we see John actually reclining on the couch. That's how they ate in those days. That's that how it was done in that society. And John is right next to Jesus, and leaning his head back, lays it right on Jesus' breast. And Jesus even committed the care of his mother to John after his death. They were really close. But what happened when John saw Jesus revealed in his heavenly glory? Let me share that with you. I, John, your brother, and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, Write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, 
to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like white wool like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in the furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. Amen. Yes, John was afraid. How would you be if you stood before the one whose eyes were like a flame of fire, seeing right into your heart, nothing hidden? How would you be if you stood before the one who bears a sharp two-edged sword with which to strike down the nations in judgment? Yes, John was afraid. And I'm afraid that we've lost that in an age of comfortable preaching that has the goal of making people feel good when they come to church. So am I saying that we need to be terrified to come into the presence of God? Oh no. He placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death. <clears throat> when we look to Jesus, and to Jesus only, who died for our sins in our place, Paul says in Romans 3, we who have sinned and fall short of the glory of God are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation, satisfying the justice of an angry God, satisfying that justice by his blood, and we receive that gift by faith. And it is an endless source of wonder that we are able to come into the presence of God and not be afraid. It is amazing grace. We ought not to lose the wonder of that. Is your faith in Christ? Are you looking to him alone and not anything you have done to earn God's approval? If you're looking to him, Jesus says to you, as he said to John, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one, and I was dead and I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death. Yes, death is a scary thing. But for the Christian, death is going home. The chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to arrest Jesus. But he was not the one who was in trouble. They are. But for all who will put their trust in him who will, like John, in his childlike trust, rest themselves on Jesus' loving heart, heaven becomes not a place of fear, but home. Now maybe, well certainly, there are folks for whom the illustration of heaven is home. Maybe they didn't have a happy home. Maybe home for them was a place of fear. But I think everyone can imagine what a real home would be like. They can go home. They got to take you in. They're home. Heaven becomes home. For God 
the fear-inspiring judge so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish in eternal judgment, but have eternal life. And the Son, who will sit on that throne of judgment, so loved you that he came and accomplished that rescue, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God and says to us, do not 